Oshkosh. Yes. Uh, Oshkosh, please join us. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me from the back? OK, good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, innovation, uh, technology innovation showcase. Uh, I'm representing New Mexico Tech. I teach uh, in the mechanical department. And um, for some time, for the last maybe about 10 years, we've been working uh, trying to design and develop some water desalination system. And we have gone quite far. And with that, all the results, so I thought probably it's a good time that we can present to this group of people and find out where we are. So with that, uh, so this is my, uh, and nowadays we are also talking everything green. It has to be green, so we will see uh, how our technology is as, as green as possible. So this is a des desalination, and uh, with that, so let us go to my team. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, this is a, uh, a group of uh, researchers, and uh, we have worked for quite some time. Uh, then we have got our management team, uh, and our, our uh, VP uh, is here, and also the executive director is also here. And then we also have another team of management team who are also working at the, looking at the market, marketability of this product that we've been working on. And we have been, as you can see, we started this project quite uh, like 2006, so which is like, what, uh, 20, 17 years before. So we are still working, so <laughs> it is never ending. But um, as, you, as, as you can see, the first two years, 2006 to 2008, we had some funding from the Navy. Um, they wanted to have some uh, desalination um, system that can be used for produce water. Uh, that's for the Southeast New Mexico. They produce a lot of uh, produce water, and there was, at that time, um, they, they used this injection um, the wells to inject it back to the formations, and, um, but that is not the way that they wanted to use it, this water. And so we got some funding from the Navy for two years, and during the, f uh, and we were supposed to use a membrane called geolite membrane. That is what uh, we did, um, um, you know, in New Mexico Tech, we have a uh, research wing called PRRC, and we did some research there, and we developed a uh, membrane called geolite membrane. And that membrane, we used it in the first year of the Navy uh, project, um, and then, but we did not get the, and we were using the RO, reverse osmosis, but we did not get the results the throughput that we were looking for, and then second year of that project, we switched to from reverse osmosis to uh, the new method called the forward osmosis. That is what I'm going to be uh, discussing. And then far, far, subsequently, uh, one year of the second year of the Navy, we got some very good results with the forward osmosis. And then we, with, the, with the results, then we went to a DOE uh, and ETL, and uh, we got some about $1.3 million to um, kind of develop it and also take it to the uh, pilot scale uh, at uh, Southeast New Mexico. We did that and we got very good results and that is what I'm going to present today and then subsequently we got a very small grant from the small business New Mexico. So that is where it's a little bit of history for what we did so far. So as you can see right now for this uh, uh, group I just um, so, you know, taken two extreme uh, uh, the, the markets. One market is the industrial market, which can which can use millions of gallons of water per day. So, supposing if you are looking at the oil and gas industry, as you can see there, that the, you know the, those are the the 120 barrel truck they use. They go to different sites, collect the, all the produced water, they bring it to this in this, this pond and they get it evaporated and that is how they were disposing this uh, produced water. But then as you can see, next to this pond there is a, um, you know, this is the, called the um, potash industry. Uh, Southeast New Mexico is very, very famous, number one in the country uh, in the production of K2O, uh, potash industry. So if, and, and they also use brine solutions in their process. So it is possible that if we can clean it to the requirement of this potash industry, then we should be able to just, uh, with a pipeline, we can just take it. We don't have to 
dispose of uh, this good, good water that they use otherwise. So that, that, that is one of the market that we were uh, at that time uh, looking at. And the other one is then, and, and sorry, uh, other one is the very small market that, you know, it's a distributed market, small. Uh, and as you can see here that um, the Americans without safe and adequate running water, thousands of, say, this is a small, uh, this, uh, this uh, you know, market is kind of a diff different kind of market, like a recommended maybe 5,000 gallons a day system. It's not a bigger, as big as big, this one, but it has got different characters. As you can see here that many families, they drive like 25 to 40 miles to get drinking water. So that is a kind of market that we are looking at. So we are right now with this presentation, I'm trying to look at two different extremes. Um, here, can we clean this water good enough that we can uh, able to, we will be able to provide it to this potash industry? So that is one market. It's a very big market, you know. You know uh, and then the other one is that you know distributed market. Can we find out, you know, all those uh, from the geological map? Look at the, the all the formations and the salinity, and then uh, maybe we can dig some wells, and then uh, we should be able to, uh, you know, make some small, small distributed, um, you know. Uh, your locations from where we should be able to uh, uh, you know, pump this uh, brine solution or brackish water, clean it, and give it to this uh, locally. That is the other market that we are looking at. So, the, um, so the, let us look at the first market, which is the uh, you know, produced water. What is produced water? So this is what you see here is the produced water. Um, the produced water also has like a TDS, which is a total dissolved solid is in the range of like about 220,000 parts per million, like when seawater is only about like 30,000 ppm. So this is about like seven times that. So it's very, very highly saline. It has got a lot of uh, organics. It also has a lot of suspended solids. So the question is that when you get a water like that, how can you clean it? So it, it, uh, it will go through you know, pre-treatment one to take care of the, all the TSS, then pre-treatment two, to, uh, all the pre-treatment two will take care of all the organics. Then once that is done, that will go to the membrane technology, and so that is where you take out the salt. So that is what happens. So now the question is that when you look at the, and we were at New Mexico Tech, we are looking at this, this, this part here. For this two part, we have got other partners at, from, at, from a company like CTI company, and so they were from the Pennsylvania, so they give, uh, gave us the, the technology. So for, for that, so so we are looking at this this one here uh, at New Mexico Tech. So what happens is that when you have this uh, you know the water with a very high high uh, in a salt content and then it goes through this membrane, what you see as membrane fouling is an issue. It's a very big issue, and that is even worse in the case of an RO when you provide a lot of lot of you know, pressure. Okay. So the question is that uh, how can you take care of this problem? Like you know, otherwise it becomes very very expensive uh, in, in terms of the, also the amount of energy. So as you can see here, that if you have brackish water like 16,000 ppm, so the energy cost is like 11 percent, okay, of that total cost. And then if you have seawater, which is like from 16,000 to like 30,000 your energy cost is like 41, 44 percent. It's like energy cost, like it increases exponentially as, as the TDS increases. So now the question is, this is just a 30,000. Now we have got a 220, 100,000, okay? So 220, uh, you know, 220, uh, 220,000. So that means about eight times. So the energy cost will be so much higher that it no longer remain cost effective. And the other question is that, is there any way that um, well, well, is there anything that we can do to take care of this problem? So that is the problem that we started with. So at that time, um, um, as, as you, as you also, uh, we saw that reverse osmosis is not the solution for this kind of problem. As you know that with reverse osmosis, you also apply some pressure. Membrane fouling is going to be even, even worse in the case of you know, this reverse osmosis. So what we, we went in a, uh, instead, there is another method which is called a forward osmosis, which is the opposite of reverse osmosis, where you do not apply any pressure. Is the, is the osmotic pressure difference between the solid, between the solution between, in, across the semi-permeable membrane, it, it, you pull the water from the one other side. So what happens is that, as you can see here, this is the, your, um, uh, your schematic diagram. So this is the membrane here, okay? And you have, you have the saline water, this is the, we call it a feed side. And then what we will do is that in the draw side, we'll, supposing if your feed side has got a uh, saline water of two molar, then what we'll do is that we'll create a draw solution, okay? 
of higher concentration. So as a result, what happens is that then the water will come from the feed side into the draw side, and then we'll break that draw side, draw solution into water and whatever it is. So that is what we'll be doing. So in the for osmosis, we'll be using draw solution, which is called ammonium bicarbonate, and that is what we'll be, we'll, we, we, we were doing. And then we use the uh, you know, membrane called a cellulose triacetate membrane. It's a very good membrane. It is very durable. It is also plant-based, so it's a green. And, and so that is what we were using. And this has, if you, if you are, if you design correctly, then this membrane can have a life of like six to seven months or even a little bit more than that also. So, so that is the kind of membrane that we are using, and we are using the for osmosis. Now the question is that, is it better than RO or not? So let us see, okay. So what is happening with this for osmosis is that, so this is the issue, concentration polarization. So supposing, you know, think about in a, in a, uh, this is a feed side, and this is a draw side, and you have the membrane in between. And in the feed side, you have got the water molecules, and then so, supposing these are salt molecules, b bigger molecules, and then what happens is that some of the water molecules will go through this, uh, this, this pores of this membrane, and then you can see here that this bigger, bigger, so like this is, we are using the ammonium bicarbonate as the draw solutions, the bigger molecules, they will shift. As a result, now there is no osmotic pressure difference. Now, water is every, both the sides, there is no pressure difference, so no, nothing is happening. So what we did is that we said, okay, we are going to scrap that surface of this membrane. Okay, and that is what we did. We added this, uh, we call it mechanically sweeping the surface, not just one side, both the sides. And it did the, did the wonder. As you can see here that we, we did that, and then this is the result that we got in the, in the lab. So what you see here is the, um, as you can see here, that this is the osmotic uh, pressure dip. So this is the, what is this? Uh, osmotic pressure. Yeah, the osmotic pressure difference. And then this side is the water throughput, okay? And what we have compared, at that time, there's another group of people, who was a researcher at Yale University, they were using the same for osmosis, they were also developing a system, and so we had their, their results. So that is what you see here, this green, uh, your, this one, this is their results, and we are here. So we got about like 65 times higher throughput than what they got. So basically, you know, this is so good that at least we, with the, with the sweeping uh, element and this and that, so we were able to get two patents in 2016, one for the process, one for the apparatus. So we were, uh, we know that we have got a good result, so now let us look at the economics of that. So then we, with the money that we got from the DOE, we did uh, go to the, uh, in, in a house, uh, we got you know, in Southeast New Mexico, we went to half Southeast New Mexico. We demonstrated that in front of the, we, we invited all the oil you know, owners. They came, they gave us the water, then we ran it through this one, then we tested it to see that you know, all the salts are being taken away. And so we got very good results. Based on this result that we saw here, we did the economic analysis. So you can see here that in this analysis, we have got, this is a 100 mega gallons a day system. It is RO and FO. So this is the FO, our system, and this is the RO here. And this is for, a, as you can see, we have used some of the assumptions here, and that is for true for both the FO and RO. And so as you can see here, these numbers are, uh, you know, as, as you increase the TDS, our system is not so sensitive, so it does increase the cost, but it is not, uh, not like the RO. So we were getting very, very good results, and the question is that, you know, can we take it to the market? Now, as you, as you recently saw, last month, not, you know, in Texas, uh, in Midland, so they had this earthquake uh, because of this produced water they were injecting back into the formation, so they were getting this earthquake. So now the question is that if this happens, you know, often then, they, you know, this is, there will be regulation that you will not be able to use the, the produced water in injecting back. So you have to do something. So the question is that even if it is very expensive, you have to do that. So the markets are there, okay? Markets are there, and that is what we should be able to uh, capture this market. So what we have done also, uh, at the request of another company in Abilene, Texas, so they asked us to you know, put together a, about like 125 barrels, which is almost like a 6,000 uh, gallons a day system, and we put them together, and this is the design it looks like. So we can put it into a container, like 620 feet long container, and you can haul it to the places that you want to go. go. And so this has all been you know, designed, and Yes, everything's ready right now. 
So okay, now look at the competition. So I was looking at the competition yesterday. As you can see here that uh, this is from the Texas uh, Water uh, Development Board. So this is the price that they have given for, you know, the, what they are saying is that uh, if you are the cost for the you know, water, water desalination of uh, brackish water and so, so, you know, brackish water means this is the kind of, you know, PPM and seawater is this much. And so this is the, this is the number here, which is your, uh, as you can see, a two, uh, 246 to 430, and we are getting almost like $2 per 1,000 gallons a day system. So we were almost 50% of what uh, Texas, what they are saying. So we have a, the market is there, and we should be able to capture that. So current status, uh, uh, DOE, right now, there is a pro, you know, right now I'm working with the Sandia National Lab scientists who are working on the, uh, so as you can see, uh, the second generation CARTs we are developing right now. And so we are also making the uh, distillation and the recapture process in a, in a green technology based. And, and so we are also trying to understand if we can set up uh, the system at uh, New Mexico, so then what sort of the different uh, feasibility study, I'm just right now going through that. And also our uh, New Mexico Tech uh, Office of Innovation so and Commercialization, they are also helping us trying to understand the business planning of, of this whole thing. So with that, I'm almost there. So uh, looking for partners, as you can see here that um, right now there are two markets that I have, uh, I have um, you know, kind of discussed a little bit, like one is a distributed market, one is your produced water market, and so their requirements are different, and so the, as you can see here that these are the requirements for the, these two markets, and we are looking for some partners, and, uh, and I'll be happy to talk to any um, you know, who will be interested. So with that, let me just go to the last one, which is that in summary, uh, energy efficient desalination and desalination technology is developed and field demonstrated for a, for a small system like about 1,000 gallons a day system. And IP, US patent pr protected, we also, you know, two large markets are identified capable of treating highly saline water. Current technology readiness level is almost six. And our, as I have said, vice president and also executive director, they are here if there is anything that you need to talk to them also. With that, let me go to the last one. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, as someone who uh, lives in California, any, anybody that's doing desalination, given our drought, despite the fact that we've solved our drought in the last two months, um, is, uh, is very, very amazing to hear about. Two questions, one comment, one question. <clears throat> I think comment in terms of the presentation, Super interesting. I think I followed along, but I think it was very, very technical as well. So I think there, there's an element of maybe if you're dealing with people in okay. rooms like me, I don't want to say dumb it down, but, but okay. make it a little bit more approachable. Um, but a question for you, you know, you identified, it seems like, very two specific markets within desalination. Yeah. Can you talk about, uh, either include it in the future, but also talk about how big can this get, right? I mean, desalination is a large topic. We've, I've seen presentations over time of you know, many different ways to approach it, certainly in the state of California. But beyond what you're addressing right now, which I know will take time and effort and so forth, are there additional applications that you could even see beyond that? So that is why I have given you the two extremes. Like in this 200,000 PPM, and here is a water, brackish water, that you probably get, which is by maybe 1,000 gallons, 1,000 ppm. Yeah. So in between, suppose if you're in California, if you want to do for seawater, suppose for, for that matter, which is like 30,000 to 35,000. So we'll be able to fit into this one. Right. So I have given, that's why I have taken two extremes, so that, and then trying to tell you that anything in between, we can fit in. Okay, I understand. Yes. Thank you. Question from another uh, fellow Californian. <laughs> um, of course, um, one of the things that I did notice that um, uh, everyone is trying to go for the desalination, but one of the challenges that Carlsbad or Montreal did face and even Santa Barbara is it was impacting the uh, aquaculture because that concentrated brine was getting into uh, back, pumped back into the ocean, thereby marine life was yes. getting impacted. So what's so unique about your technology that would probably address the, the aquaculture aspect of the desalination? So for aquaculture, I, if I know correctly, so they also need some amount of salinity in the water, is it not? Like, are you talking about algaes or what, what sort of aquaculture you're talking about? Uh, the marine diver, uh, uh, biodiversity that exists uh, and their ecosystem is getting um, kind of 
kind of uh, under, under fire because of the concentrated brine solution kind of being pumped back into the ocean. Okay. And thereby, the, the entire marine biodiversity is going for a toss. OK. So again, um, so when you get that water, and since we are using a cellulose triacetate uh, membrane, and this only lets you let the water molecule go through, then you have the bigger one like sodium chloride or other bigger molecules, including some of the organics, this, it, it resists that. So the question is that if we are, this, you know, this, this water that you have from the, if, you know, first thing is that if there is some organics, then we'll probably have to remove the organics first, as, as, we, as you have seen in this, that we have the pretreatment one and two, one is for the, uh, total sus suspended solids, so a pretreatment two is for the organics and then the desalination. So depending on what the quality of the water, once you run it through and get a chemistry of this water, then we'll be able to say, okay, yes, yeah, there is some little bit of you know, organics, so we'll run it through the pretreatment two. So we are done with the organics. Now we have the salt. We can take care of the salt as much as needed, okay, depending on where it is and where you want to go. So we can design that process. Well, thank you. And this has been a very serious uh, presentation. I loved it. But on a, on a, on a fun note, uh, I did see the team slide, and you look so younger. Is that what caused this? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Really okay, appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Koch. So our next presenter is with Sandia and Christopher Riley. If you'd come to the podium. Oh, thank you. Right on that. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all here today. Very happy to share some of the work that we've done at Sandia recently. Uh, so this is work uh, from a project I led over the last two years or so uh, with the main uh, objective of trying to design effective emission control catalysts that could upgrade uh, airborne emissions into more benign substances for us to breathe safely. Uh, or to even upgrade these into valuable chemicals that could be sold for a profit. So uh, when we started this project, the main issue that we wanted to address was natural gas flaring. And there's an example of it in this photo, and if you're not familiar with it, it's essentially the burning of natural gas at oil field sites. Uh, the gas comes up alongside oil, but in these locations, uh, it's basically seen as a unwanted byproduct. <coughs> And so instead of being captured, transported, and sold, uh, it's just burnt uh, on site. So this is a really widespread practice. Uh, in the US alone, we flare over a billion cubic feet of natural gas each day. And each year, this amounts to over uh, several billion dollars of wasted revenue, assuming that we could capture that natural gas and sell it instead of just wasting it. Uh, now, on a global scale, uh, because this practice is, is done in oil-producing nations around the world, uh, this you know, natural gas flaring accounts for several hundred million tons of CO2 that's generated and enters our atmosphere each year. So there are very clear economic and environmental incentives to try to reduce flaring and to use this precious resource uh, judiciously. So uh, my team and I envisioned tackling this issue by trying to uh, design some sort of decentralized upgrading system that could be deployed at wellhead sites. And so instead of just simply burning that natural gas that comes up alongside oil, you would flow it through a catalytic system that would upgrade it into value-added products. And we thought that if there would be a larger profit from this, it might incentivize designing infrastructure to actually capture and use that natural gas instead of just wasting it as a nuisance. And so the, this is kind of a simplistic system just with some uh, basic concepts that we hope to kind of integrate into such a, an upgrading system. So essentially the idea would be to flow natural gas and carbon dioxide through this central uh, piping system. 
And inside the pipe, you would have a loaded catalyst bed that would uh, facilitate chemical reactions that would upgrade that natural gas and CO2 into valuable chemicals like hydrogen and synthesis gas. Now, because this reaction has to operate at really high temperatures, we didn't want to burn natural gas to really provide the heat for that reaction like we do conventionally. And so we wanted to test the applicability of concentrated solar equipment uh, that can focus sunlight onto that catalyst bed and heat it up to really high temperatures that are needed. So uh, over the course of a year and a half or so, my team and I did various proof of concept experiments. Uh, we uh, actually loaded catalyst beds and, and used dish solar collectors to heat the catalyst up to very hot temperatures and had success there. Uh, and primarily, we uh, designed a very novel catalyst that's not subject to a lot of the same deactivation mechanisms as catalysts that we see in the literature. Uh, we designed a catalyst that lasts longer, it has better selectivity for making products that we want, and it's a very cheap design. And so I, I'm the scientist, so I, I could, you know, I, I'd love to talk to any of you who are interested about the technology, uh, but I'm going to try to focus more on the, the business uh, side of things. And so I'm presenting primarily today on the work that followed these initial successes. Uh, so following that experimentation and, and kind of our proof of concept experiments, I entered into the Energy i -Corps program along with my teammate Judy Hendricks. And over the course of two months, we conducted uh, a lot of customer discovery uh, around our technology. And we wanted to identify whether our technology was basically solving the issues pertinent to methane flaring that might help to sort of wean us off this practice and, and move closer towards actually using this natural gas. And so over the course of two months, we ended up holding 65 interviews. We, we contacted hundreds of industry professionals. Uh, and we learned a lot about all of the challenges that exist to moving away from flaring and, and a lot of the reasons why flaring is done today. Um, we learned, unfortunately, you know, at first that our, our um, innovations in the catalyst design and even implementing renewable energy just weren't really addressing the pertinent issues that keep flaring in place as a practice. And so through the i program, we had to pivot and try to find different uh, applications for the catalyst that we had developed. So Judy and I uh, contacted, contacted folks within the anaerobic digestion industry. Uh, this is a technology that's mature. Uh, it takes biological waste and converts it into methane. So we thought, well, you know, if we can take their methane and run it through our system and create even more value, uh, that might be uh, profitable and a great incentive to them. But we learned that in a lot of those units, they use the methane quite efficiently. They burn it on site for energy and heat generation. So the methane is not really going to waste. And so as our i -Corps instructors would say, you have more of like a mosquito bite problem rather than a shark bite. There's not really any big issue that we would be addressing. We also, after that, uh, started talking to folks within the chemical industry. Uh, surely if we had a catalyst that had a cheap design, it lasts a long time, and it's regenerable, surely we thought that those would be advantages over some of the more conventional designs that are out there. But we learned that in a lot of the chemical production facilities, the catalyst is actually a really small part of the, the cost. It's really quite negligible. And even if you increase the lifespan of it a little bit, that doesn't always uh, fit into their overall maintenance schemes. And so it's not necessarily helpful. Eventually, we ended up pivoting to the automotive industry where we found a little bit more traction. So in talking to folks uh, within uh, vehicle production of gasoline and uh, diesel vehicles, we found that there were some really prolific pain points that they've had for a long time involving their catalytic converter technology. Their catalytic converter, of course, uh, taking the harmful gases leaving your engine and converting it into gases that are uh, a little safer for us to breathe. So uh, from concentrating our customer discovery on uh, this specific industry, we found these running themes. Uh, these being that uh, every couple years or so, emission regulations are getting stricter and stricter. Uh, limiting the amount of emissions that can leave your, your car or, or your other vehicle's tailpipe and entering our air. And in order to meet these ever uh, tighter restrictions or regulations, 
uh, companies have to implement or add larger quantities of catalytic metal into their converter, and this is really uh, quite pricey, so it adds significantly to the cost of the product. And if they're not able to meet these regulations, companies can be hit with really big fines for not doing so. So there, there's this huge uh, kind of like risk-averse nature where they want to almost hedge their bets and add a lot more expensive metal. So from all of these talks, we kind of distilled uh, what we learned down to several value propositions. So we learned that basically if we can offer a different catalyst design that can reduce uh, precious metal use, uh, we would be reducing cost of the catalyst. And we would also reduce the risk to these companies because of the price volatility of these precious catalytic metals, uh, which can be uh, really subject to international conflicts. Uh, we also honed in on the customer segments that would be uh, most, um, I, I guess, have the, the largest um, stake in this, have the biggest catalytic converters, and be the less likely to be electrified, which are freight vehicles like diesel semi-trucks, as well as really large off-road diesel vehicle equipment. That, that's not easy to have, uh, you know, electrification, hydrogen uh, powered and is likely to be around for a while to come. So from this, we kind of went back to the lab and we did some testing with our catalyst. And we used our catalyst design, but in chemical reactions that are relevant to your catalytic converter. And we showed that before and after accelerated aging studies, our catalyst was not prone to the same deactivation that we saw within conventional catalyst designs. And uh, as a big note, we were able to just use platinum-based catalyst instead of adding platinum and palladium, which is conventional in diesel and gasoline catalytic converters. Uh, palladium is about, uh, I believe, twice the cost or 50% more expensive than platinum, but right now it's seen as necessary because it stabilizes the catalyst from degradation uh, over time, so it's hard to get away from this. We are seeing with our design so far that we're actually able to go without this extra precious metal. Now, we did just an estimated cost breakdown structure for a conventional catalyst design and what we believe our catalyst would cost. And without palladium, if we were to implement our catalyst design and the biggest of catalytic converters, those semi-trucks, those off-road diesel equipment, we might be saving well over $1,000 per catalytic converter. Uh, we also did some estimates of the market size, and we believe uh, our SOM would be around $200 million if we go after one company and one vehicle line and are just able to implement our catalyst within that. So uh, through the i program, we really, really tried to distill our value prop proposition down to just you know, a very specific statement. So uh, we came up with, we believe we can reduce a catalytic converter cost by 20 to 30%. Uh, for diesel vehicle manufacturers by implementing a palladium-free diesel oxidation catalyst design uh, that still meets CARB and EPA regulations. So uh, moving forward in our customer discovery, we wanted to talk to the whole ecosystem involved. So all of the different entities that are involved in the process of uh, sourcing the materials, making the catalytic converter, uh, regulating this, testing its performance, and so we got an idea of the specific companies we would talk to, uh, all of the different uh, relationships between them, and we tried to get a sense of what our foot in the door would be. And so we identified that uh, our best chance forward would be to do some proof of concept testing uh, and to hopefully, if we still showed good results, partner up with a catalyst manufacturing company uh, to jointly develop our catalyst, and if it still shows promising performance, then to market this to a vehicle manufacturer. So over the course of the program, uh, this is one of the end results we came up with, which is basically a three-year plan moving forward of uh, if we're able to obtain more funding since our project has ended at this point, uh, what we would do and how we would use that and our strategy. So in year one, we would basically take all of the specific testing that we know catalytic companies would want to see before engaging with us and before partnering up and uh, in year one, we would put our catalyst through all those tests and do proof of concepts. And if we're still able to have a viable design, then we would hope to form an NDA with uh, one of, I think, three or four catalyst manufacturers within this industry. Uh, we could pass off catalyst to them. They could test it under more realistic, scaled-up conditions. 
if everything looks good, in year three, we would hope to engage uh, an actual vehicle manufacturer. Now, I'm, I'm not going to pretend like this is a sure thing. There's a lot of what ifs here. Uh, we're still really early in the process, but you know, we're very grateful to have gone through the Energy i program, as exhausting a process as it was. Uh, but yeah, we gained a lot of knowledge, and I think we have a pathway to actually start to move our technology, hopefully out of the lab space and into the industry, or at least to identify pathways to do so. Uh, so with that, thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate your attention, and yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for enlightening us about uh, the possibilities uh, sure. in this particular space. I have a quick question about the, the cost associated to recycling and waste disposal, which is plaguing this specific segment of industry. Um, with this innovation, what kind of impact do you foresee that would cause to lower the cost of recycling as well as waste disposal? Sure. So, oh, I, sorry, I guess I can't go back. Um, there is this whole process of kind of leasing uh, the precious metals. Uh, so, of course, you know, when your catalytic converter goes bad, you don't want to just throw it in the, in the waste disposal. All of those materials are recycled, uh, which does cost money, but you recover the rare earth elements. And so it's almost like companies will lease the material, uh, you know, um, and, and that's from a relationship in between the material suppliers, the automotive uh, manufacturers, and the catalyst manufacturers, too. Uh, even so, um, periodically, these vehicle manufacturers have to buy a lot of precious metal in bulk. And, and so they try to pick low price points, uh, just historically, I guess, or at current times, where they can buy a lot at a low price and then have this kind of in storage for use over time in their catalytic converters. Um, so we think that you know if we're able to get away from some of those metals, uh, we're going to save them some uh, of the price involved in that, some of the risk, you know, in, in buying at uh, a high point. I, I don't know if that exactly answered your question, but Thank yeah, you. sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, no, the hook. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Next presenters are from NMSU, and we have Joan Wilson and Tiana Zambra Zambrano. <laughs> Thank you, good afternoon. We're so excited to be here today and share our idea with you for an innovative assistive technology. Oh, I'm Joan S.C. E. Wilson. And I'm Tiana Zambrano, and we are the founders of Haptic Zone Communication. Picture it. You're cruising down the freeway, listening to your favorite tunes. You're about to merge off, but in the blink of an eye, a raging driver strikes your car. The world is at a standstill. You wake up in the hospital, traumatized and unsure of your condition. You try to yell for some water because your mouth is so dry, but the words fail to come out. The doctor walks in and tells you, you've lost your ability to speak. Tears start rolling down your cheeks as you realize you may never be able to tell your spouse you love them again or read your child's favorite books. Over two million Americans utilize some form of assistive communication to exercise the First Amendment. And this number is drastically increasing as we'll see 795,000 people will have a stroke this year and one in 44 children will be diagnosed with autism in the United States alone. What is augmentative and alternative communication? It's just another way to communicate without using your physical voice. We are focusing on the electronic augmentative and alternative communication market, which encompasses speech generating devices and mobile applications. Here's a brief demo of an old school device and how it's used. I need a drink. All right. So we could write a novel on why these devices belong in the trash, spare you the headache and touch on a few major issues. These devices look like cinder blocks and they draw attention to the user's disability rather than their capabilities. 
You've got to spend countless hours of your time learning how to navigate things, these things. This can be a daunting and exhausting task for the therapist setting it up, the user, and their families. Beyond robotic voices, users have to hunt and peck through these poorly drawn cartoon sketches um, to join conversations. And by the time they're done pecking, people are on to the next topic. Do you speak Spanish, Chinese, or maybe French? Well, my friend, a majority of this market has left multilingual people in the dust. And oh, it is a nightmare to acquire one of these devices through insurance because our biggest competitor requires speech language pathologists to serve as gatekeepers in areas that are covered by insurance. Prices can be as high as $15,000 for one device without insurance coverage. Yikes! So it's no wonder why 60% of assistive communication tech users often ditch them. And within the first year, because they just can't get the job done. But we have a solution. We envision dramatically improving the human computer interaction experience for assistive tech users by leveraging Existing AI and language processing engines, we're creating a novel assistive communication application that utilizes smart context. What is smart context? It's our app's incredible ability to contextualize, learn, make predictions using a user's location, emotion, their social groups, and much more. Imagine you're taking your mom out to eat a few months after a stroke. She pulls up Haptic Zone and lets the magic begin. Instantly, her favorite menu items are popping up using our geolocation feature. Biosensor data senses she's in a calm mood, so she's able to politely tell the waitress, I want green chicken enchiladas with onion. As you and mom await the food, the app's listening in on the latest gossip you have about your lazy coworkers. Mom's able to dive into the conversation without skipping a beat. They're so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's a t I know, it's a tough act to follow, I know. <laughs> so let's take a second, or a minute, sorry, and we're just gonna walk through and kind of look at the flow of our application. So like Tiana said, mom just has to turn this thing on, it'll automatically geolocate and let in check in where she's at, wherever that may be. Um, it'll uh, start listening to familiar voices and populate the screen with uh, things specific to those people so she can make some choices about what, what she might want to say. Next, it's gonna listen to content words that are being spoken with high frequency and near proximity and populate the screen with some of those options um, for her so she can start to jump right in without hunting and pecking and jump into that conversation. Of course, when she does this, it will not sound like a robot on our device because we would like to add emotion to the speech that's generated. And we would like to do that by synchronizing a bunch of biosensors together um, from emotion sensitive sources like electrodermal activity and skin conduct, or electrodermal activity and skin conductors and uh, heart rate through a beautiful watch or bracelet that mom might be wearing. Um, and also through facial emotion expression analysis and vocal acoustics. And so that way when the speech is generated, it'll sound like her. Um, and this is also useful because this provides some emotion content that can be shared with caregivers and family and loved ones about how mom is doing because she has difficulty communicating and doesn't, may not want to hunt and peck around to explain to people that she's feeling distressed or having anxiety. And so this will immediately alert a caregiver to how she's doing. All of this will eventually just populate on the screen. It'll be very specific to the situation, very contextualized, very individual um, and adaptive. And then it will generate speech for her that has emotion in it and she'll be in the conversation. Um, so this piece about the caregiver and alerts to the caregiver we think is really important because for people we know from research that people who suffer from or can't use their own voices to communicate, um, that these people often commonly suffer from depression and anxiety and there may be an increased risk for suicide. And so this helps, again, to alert caregivers without putting the burden on mom to have to self-report. Um, how did we come up with what we wanted to include in our product? Uh, well, we scoured through tons of existing research, and then we completed a nationwide survey of communication disorders professionals who serve about 1,100 children who use and need assistive communication. 
So what is our market for assistive communication? Well, we're really focused on this $370 million serviceable obtainable market, and that's just at a rate of 5% market penetration, which we think is a really conservative number for um, our initial launch. And who is our competition? These are the biggest competitors, as Tiana described. The people in the lower left corner over there, they're the ones who go after the painful process of insurance reimbursement. Um, they're complicated to use, they're expensive, they cost as much as eight or $15,000. Um, so this really limits the number of people they can reach around the world because so much of the world doesn't have infrastructure for insurance. Um, so we know, in comparison, that most of the world has access to the iOS market, and that's how we want to reach our users so they can easily download a simple-to-use product that's custom to them and with a subscription of less than $1,000 and bypass insurance. Um, our model is we want to offer sev several different kinds of subscriptions. We want to sell some cool accessories uh, to customize it for people. We want to have licensing specifically for schools. Tiana and I are both speech language pathologists. We've worked in low resource schools. We want to make that available to schools. And uh, again, we're SLPs, so we're very interested in language therapy and know that this device could really, or our, our product could really help uh, in the therapy market as well. Um, where have we been and where are we going? Uh, with the help of NMSU's Arrowhead Center, Patricia Knighton, thank you. Um, we have a utility patent pending. We have d all kinds of identified resources to help us. We have a huge network of New Mexico schools willing to prototype for us, prototype test for us. And we did Aggie Shark Tank a few months ago in Las Cruces and we came home with two awards, uh, the Crowd Favorite and a Hunt Foundation Award. Oh, sorry, there we go. And where are we going? Well, obviously, we would like to develop our software. <laughs> and then we are in the process right now of writing an SBIR NSF grant. And then, of course, we want to prototype test, make modifications as needed, get our marketing in line, and we want to launch to the iOS market. We see tons of potential for the future with what we have. We really like the, the expanding the, the paired caregiver app piece. We, there's a ton of things we could do with memory support for cognitive decline on this. And then we've had some interest specifically in that emotional distress piece for, um, you know, so that people don't have to self-report their anxiety or depression or distress. Uh, to get our minimal viable product to develop our smart context, we need these two first things that we want to focus on. We right away need that geolocation piece, and we need the screen to populate with uh, words and phrases that are found in the immediate environment. With those two things alone, we can be up and rolling and have people in the conversation. So we're looking for investors and strategic partners to develop our tech and get it to market because basic communication is a human right, but multi-dimensional communication is our human quest. So we, you've heard from us, we want to hear from you guys. What questions, what questions can we answer? <laughs> Hi there, Hi. love your enthusiasm, thank you so much. Um, question about competition. Mm -hmm. um, so the people who make the bricks, we don't want, right? So want. that competition, that, that's an easy one to figure out. Yes. What about um, smart software developers who see what you do and say, hey, I can do that too? Uh, well, we have a patent. We're, we have a utility patent pending. It's very specific for that software development. I mean, we are leveraging existing technology and AI and other language processing engines, but we're doing it in a way that's unique to our application and what we're using it for. And I would like to add, it's such a niche market, and as a speech language pathologist, we're getting the hands-on, you know, we're seeing hands-on how these devices really can be improved. Whereas I feel like a person who's just coming in as an engineer, which most of these guys are, most of these guys are very involved, are, um, you know, competitors, like Toby Dynavox is our largest competitor, for example. Um, these guys know their industry, but why haven't they done it yet? You know, that's, that's the big question. And also, um, you know, again, having that hands-on experience working with these people and day in, day out, knowing what they need just because we've experienced that. So that's where I'd say our team would differ. Um, so thank you for that presentation. Awesome enthusiasm too, couldn't agree more. Um, and as some uh, parents with, with caregivers and, and so they can communicate right now, but I appreciate that inner, inner relationship and how important that is. Um, 
So you're, you're just a question for you. Are you have you developed any software yet, or this is just the, the, an idea? It's mostly a concept. We have a super minimal <clears throat> proto, like a very minimal prototype, <laughs> because we're just we're we've only been working on this a few months, um, and we've gotten people to help out basically. Yeah. But we need to take it to the next level where we have people who are really all in and want to and help with the programming. Okay, got it. Um, and then as you think about, let's just say your product's built now. You're ready. How are you going to distribute it? How are you going to, I mean, except for through iOS, but how are you going to make people aware of it, get people to download it right? I mean, are you going to partner with all these people you've been talking to? Um, how, do, how do you think about that kind of mod, that channel model to get it out in the hands of people that need it? I mean, frankly, uh, we, we think about Facebook and Instagram like everybody. And the reason I say that for two reasons. One is I'm a researcher at NMSU as well, and I've had to reach autism participants, the hardest group of people to recruit ever, probably. And I've been able to do that because I figured out when you have a really niche po population like we are looking at, you can reach those people pretty well on there. And so then we start looking globally. This is the second reason. We looked at countries like Rwanda even, like, no, no assistive communication there at all, right? But tons of people. And guess what? They're downloading healthcare apps. And they're, they have Facebook. Those are their top apps. They have Facebook, Instagram. They have all this stuff. And so I kind of have a sense of how much it even costs per person, per customer to reach those people, um, given the population, given the prevalence of these disorders, and, and being able to really specifically target those with certain language and things like that. They say they uh, save the best for the last. So kudos to the team who saved them for the last. Um, amazing presentation. Really love the energy. Um, there, when, when I was doing a quick uh, search and I found that app to walks uh, and uh, Fluent AAC and there are a few other apps that are already there. Um, so the upper quadrant that I saw kind of empty, actually reality is far from that. Um, uh, while you're focusing on the conceptualization, I always use this, conceptualization to commercialization. So marketing is just one, one angle to it. There are other pieces of business strategy. So who is thinking, and if you can just share some more details about how you intend to take the, traverse that journey, that would be helpful. Okay. So to speak on those other applications, they're essentially the same as the devices. They're literally putting like paper, like you know, um, you know, it's a, it's similarly like this, but a lot bigger and a lot more interfaces to go through, and it's all essentially the same. The market, like um, another big app is Proloquo, which we didn't mention because they're doing the same kind of concept as these big competitors, um, and you know, we're more than happy to. I mean, we didn't add it today just because you know, as far as just the market itself, they're kind of really those applications aren't really showing up as far as being used um, from our market research. You know, I don't know if that's answering the question as far as why we didn't but include I'm those. I'm talking about yeah. uh, app to vox V-O-X, uh, just uh, APP number two, V-O-X, just look that up because mm -hmm. they claim that they are actually going away from the hardware side to more on the app. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple things with that. Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of them um, that are existing apps are either already just text to voice um, or they are just basically they took a paperboard and, and have put it on there. So there's no customization. I mean, you might be able to take a picture and stick it on there. And again, we've used these. We know because we've tried to use these. I haven't used that one, but I've certainly used Proloquo, which is one of the biggest ones. Um, and they're just, it's the same thing. They just happen to put it on a tablet or a phone. And it's really not... It's still slow. You're still hunting and pecking. It's still the, kind of the same thing unless you take the time to add a photo or something. But it's not going to customize the way we, we look at AI and all the things that are happening. It's like we can do better. Gosh, you had everything except for chat GPT into that presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought of that, too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That is the end of our tech presentations. We have one more panel left with AFRL, um, so stay tuned.